Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the YouTube channel of the Stroke and Brain Aneurysm Center of Long Island. I am Dr. Kimon Beckelis, and with me today is no other. Jason Wallen, how you doing? All right, so um, today is gonna be a little bit of a uh, different uh, episode. I think, um, you know, we're getting a lot of requests to talk about stereotactic radio surgery, or what people hear sometimes in commercials, uh, gamma knife, cyber knife, linux, different forms of stereotactic radio surgery. Um, and uh, instead of me talking to you guys about it, we thought uh, maybe you send us some questions that uh, uh, are interesting. And uh, based on those questions, uh, maybe we'll, we'll elaborate on the subject. So maybe, you know, Jason, how about we, uh, how about you tell us what folks have asked? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of people ask questions because like you said, you hear it brought up in a lot of commercials for different institutions. They make it sound like the new cutting edge uh, treatment. So uh, what is a, a stereotactic radio surgery, or as we call it, SRS? Yeah, so stereotactic radio surgery uh, is a form of radiation treatment for um, uh, pathology in the brain. And it can be either uh, tumor-related pathology or uh, blood vessel-related pathology in the brain, vascular pathology. Um, and uh, it's um, it's called radio surgery because generally speaking, it's a single session treatment uh, versus traditional radiation treatment that takes multiple sessions. This is kind of a one and done approach, similar to surgery, but it's a surgery without a knife, so to speak. Hmm. Even though they call it gamma knife. <laughs> right, right. So, so one of the one of the machines that delivers stereotactic radio surgery is the gamma knife machine. Um, and of course they, they mean gamma radiation, uh, gamma rays, uh, are the, the way you treat the pathology, but you don't use a real knife. And that's, uh, uh that's very attractive. I think to patients and physicians alike. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's the, the new and cutting edge, cutting edge thing, no pun intended. Sure. <laughs> uh, you had mentioned, you know, about certain pathologies, what pathologies exactly? So, so on the tumor side, um, there's there's multiple different tumors that can benefit from uh, stereotactic radio surgery. As a matter of fact, some of the most challenging uh, tumors uh, to treat uh, can benefit from stereotactic radio surgery. Um, uh, you know, tumors of the skull base, uh, difficult to reach areas in the brain where surgery, traditional surgery, comes at a high cost. You know, substantial risk of complications. Those areas would really benefit from stereotactic radio surgery. And interestingly, a lot of benign tumors that can become dangerous by virtue of the location where they grow and the compromise that they can have on the on the brain and on the nerves, those tumors like a meningioma, for example, those benign tumors uh, respond very, very well to stereotactic radio surgery. And so um, it's, it's a very, very good treatment tool. Of course, there's, there's some brain tumors that, that benefit more from traditional radio, uh, from traditional radiation therapy, uh, as compared to radio surgery. But I would say a very, very large number of tumors would benefit from stereotactic radio surgery. Now that's, you know, one category of patients. The other category of patients is those with a vascular pathology most commonly arteriovenous malformations. And we've done a segment on arteriovenous malformations where um, we talked about what that is, but for you, those of you guys who haven't watched that, an arteriovenous malformation is an abnormal connection between an artery and a vein, and so much so that the artery um, exerts a lot of pressure on the venous side because of that fistula, because of that abnormal connection, that shunt that's happening of blood towards the vein. Um, and of course, in that setting, uh, the vein can get under pressure or enlarge and maybe even rupture and cause bleeding. Um, so this type of pathology responds very well to stereotactic radio surgery. Again, not all patients are candidates for it, but a large number of them would be. And it also helps us with arteriovenous malformations that are located in deep areas, inoperable arteriovenous malformations. Uh, and, and other similar pathology. And the way it works for, for, uh, for these problems is that it changes the, the, the geo, the, the, changes the architecture of uh, the blood vessels and eventually it shuts down uh, in a way that they eventually shut down those abnormal connections. Uh, and uh, that fistula, that shunting stops 
happening and, and uh, the brain blood vessels um, return to their normal um, uh, anatomy and architecture. Uh, and uh, you know, it's also used for cavernous malformations, um, less, uh, less dangerous uh, vascular malformations of the brain uh, in deep uh, inaccessible areas. Uh, but that's less frequent, and uh, I think I think it's a lot more established uh, and mainstream for uh, arterial venous malformations, of course. Uh, but uh, you know, kind of in summary, I think the the major benefit of stereotactic radiosurgery for these pathologies that are complex to begin with, you know, um, tumors of the skull base, um, metastasis of the brain, arterial venous malformations, cavernomas. The major benefit is that, of course, there's no surgery. So um, the risks associated with surgery are not there, but um, it's, it's very important to, um, to understand that um, not only are you, are you dealing with um, the problem without surgery, but also you're able to reach areas that in the past would be inaccessible. So. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you had one of those bad pathologies in the past in a bad area, your choice was to let nature take its course and eventually suffer um, some very debilitating deficits from the growth of, say, a meningioma in the skull base, or undergo a surgery that had a very high risk of, um, of losing function and having the same deficits that you would get uh, eventually from disease progression. So, you know, it was not an easy choice. And now, um, you have stereotactic radiosurgery, uh, you go home the same day, uh, probably feeling the same, and eventually the tumor um, stops growing and in some cases shrinks and goes away, and same thing with arterial venous malformation. So uh, really, really uh, powerful treatments. That's pretty pretty amazing, actually, because like you said, it, it's, it opened up a whole world of, of treatment that wasn't there. Uh, how does stereotactic radiosurgery differ from traditional radiation therapy? So, so there's a major difference in that, uh, or I guess in the eyes of the patient, there's a major difference, which is generally that stereotactic radiosurgery is a single, uh, single session treatment. Although there's some exceptions to that with a short amount of sessions, sometimes depending on the size of the pathology you're treating. But generally speaking, I think that's the big thing a patient sees now. In reality, there's also differences in the way you deliver radiation to the patients. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, traditional radiation therapy involves a, a directed beam in one particular area, whereas stereotactic radiosurgery is more so, uh, a good way to conceptualize it is uh, if you were to deliver small, weak beams of radiation from all over the place with one particular target, the tissues in between the target and the source of the radiation for all these small little areas would not be exposed to a lot of radiation, but all these beams meet at that particular point that you're targeting, and that's where the beam is intensified. So you're able to impact uh, that area really substantially as compared to the surrounding tissues, whereas with traditional radiation therapy, um, you're going with a beam in one particular direction. So everything between the beam and the target would be exposed to high doses of radiation. Um, and um, a lot of people are afraid, of course, of radiation because they've seen people lose their hair or mm -hmm. develop substantial side effects. And that does not apply to stereotactic radiosurgery exactly because it's not a single beam going through the tissue, but more so several weakened beams that eventually they get together in the target. And the goal is for the target to be able to ex be exposed to a large amount of radiation, then you have a very sharp drop off in the amount of energy and radiation you give to the tissue. So I think that's uh, that's the biggest uh, selling point, but also uh, the, the major difference between the two treatments. You had mentioned the side effect of traditional uh, radiation therapy. What are some of the potential side effects of SRS? So there are very, very few, and, and a lot of them depend on the location, right? There's some areas of the brain where you can deliver stereotactic radiosurgery practically risk-free. Um, and uh, some other areas where, of course, you're worried about the impact on surrounding nerves and other structures. Um, these days, we have the ability to shield those structures very effectively and create fields that completely exclude vital structures. But of course, that's always a big concern 
uh, or it's not a big concern, but one of the biggest ones, relatively very small concern. Um, and, and so, so that's, that's, uh, that's the, the number one thing we think of. And of course, uh, the other concern is the risk of what we call radiation necrosis, which is when you deliver that energy to the target, sometimes the impact can be so profound that the tissue where you um, deliver the radiation starts to die and it kind of has a, an exaggerated response and, and you can have swelling and a bunch of other stuff related to this kind of treatment in those locations. That's very, very rare and we do a lot of things to avoid it, but certainly not zero and something that uh, definitely needs to be discussed with uh, patients and families when trying to make a decision, especially if you're weighing your options between radiation and, and open surgery. But in, in, in reality, those risks are exceedingly low and they get lower and lower as uh, our machines and our techniques are getting better. What is the, the role of other imaging modalities uh, in conjunction with uh, stereotactic radiosurgery? So, you know, when it comes to, as, as of course you guys can imagine, when it comes to stereotactic radiosurgery, the key is that we're able to deliver treatment very accurately because we are targeting very eloquent areas and we're trying to only affect the pathology and not touch normal tissue really. Um, and, uh, you know, in that setting, imaging is key. You need the best imaging and the best combination of imaging. So often um, you might need multiple imaging modalities depending on what type of pathology you're treating. You might need an MRI, you might need a, a special CT. And sometimes you might even need an angiogram if, for example, you're treating an arteriovenous malformation and you need that information. And you take all these images, you fuse them together, and then um, the radiation oncologist, the neurosurgeon, and the physicist, we all sit down together and we design the target, draw the target, and then decide on the prescription of radiation, the, the dose of radiation and the characteristics of that delivery um, that, that give you the maximum efficacy with a maximum safety at the same time. You're so good because you, you are answering questions that, that come up before, <laughs> before they come up. Uh, you know, one common one was, uh, you know, how do physicians determine uh, the dosage of it? And you just kind of answered that. Yeah, it's it's very individualized, depends on the pathology, but but it's always a conversation. There's some general guidelines and there's a lot of papers or, or research that has answered those questions, but not everybody fits perfectly in boxes and we have conversations and we modify those as we see fit. Yeah. Uh, two more questions because I, I don't want to leave anybody out. Um, sure. And I think this is a good one. What other combination of treatments can be used um, just so patients are aware of that? Oh, so, so you know, that's that's a good question. That's probably somebody that had an arteriovenous malformation and, <laughs> Correct. and uh, was offered different treatments. That makes sense. So, so commonly, of course, when it comes to tumors, uh, the choice is surgery versus radiation, right? Uh, or radiosurgery uh, generally. But when it comes to, for example, arteriovenous malformation or more of the vascular pathology, um, you have multiple different treatment options. And sometimes these treatment options can happen in isolation, but most of the times they happen in conjunction, they happen together. And so these type of treatments include surgery, where you take the pathology out, you take out the malformation, uh, stereotactic radiosurgery, like we discussed, mm -hmm. and or endovascular treatments, meaning you go in through the artery, navigate through the blood vessels and eventually find the pathology, find the arteriovenous malformation and shut down the abnormal connections with glue. Special kind of glue, not the kind you get at Kmart, of course. Uh, but uh, that particular glue is able to shut down those connections and there is no flow in the arteriovenous malformation. That's generally not used exclusively, although in some cases you can. Um, you would use that in combination either with open surgery or sometimes even with stereotactic radio surgery, but there is this interplay between the three options. Of course, there's always the option of observing something and not doing surgery or any sort of intervention, just um, monitoring something. So that's always an option also, depending on what the pathology is. So these are very individualized pathologies. And of course, work, work with your uh, primary care doctor and eventually your neurointerventionalist neurosurgeon to make those decisions about the appropriate treatment. Um, and so we're just, we're just giving general 
ideas and guidelines, but every patient is different and every decision is very individualized. Of course. And that's something that we, that we really cherish here. Uh, all the physicians right. are involved, uh, have the patients in their care. Uh, one final question, sure. um, and it kind of wraps everything up, is what is the follow-up care for SRS? So that's a great question. Um, we want to make sure it worked, right? And mm -hmm. there's no, um, if you were to do a, an MRI the day before you deliver SRS and the day after you deliver SRS, most likely it's going to look exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So there's no, um, there's no way of knowing the tumor doesn't uh, call us and say, <laughs> I'm taken care of. You know, there's no, there's no way of knowing that it worked other than follow up. And the way we follow those folks up, again, it depends on the primary pathology, mm -hmm. but in the tumor world, we would follow folks with MRIs uh, initially in short intervals, and then we relax the intervals a little bit and would expect to see eventually some shrinkage of the tumor uh, or complete resolution sometimes. Uh, most of the times we would be content with stability because uh, the goal is to stun the tumor and not allow mm -hmm. it to grow any further, not cause any more damage. Um, and uh, that's for benign tumors, of course, for, for um, uh, similar principles applied to metastasis, for example, for treatment. And then when it comes to vascular pathology, uh, generally follow-up is a combination of MRI and some sort of angiographic study, uh, often a formal angiogram to look at, at how you know, these pathologies change, evolve, and eventually hopefully go away completely. Um, and, and that happens again in regular intervals, anywhere between six months and a year. And there's, that was my yeah. follow up question yeah. for everybody is the time frame that you're looking for. Yeah. It would be six months to a year when it comes to vascular pathology for tumors. You look a little bit closer because of course those can become life threatening and there's other considerations for adjuvant additional treatments. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so you might do three months and eventually move into six months or even nine months or a year. Um, and so, yeah, so follow-up follow is important, uh, but I would say by and large, stereotactic radio surgery is very effective in treating those pathologies. Um, it's certainly one of our favorite tools to use. Uh, like we said before, you know, we, um, all these different treatment techniques are just nothing more than just different tools um, in our in our effort to contain disease and and minimize impact to the patients we love minimally invasive things because that's what we would do to ourselves that's right uh, and uh, if if we can get folks through these scary diagnoses and life-threatening pathologies without opening their head I would count that as a vic as a victory um, For sure. and and so yeah I think stereotactic radio surgery you know is very near and dear to our heart we probably have um, some of the, one of the busiest uh, practices for stereotactic radio surgery mm -hmm. uh, out in Suffolk County and likely Long Island. Uh, that's at the Stroke and Brain Aneurysm Center of Long Island. Uh, a lot of our, our partners are working uh, uh, very closely with radiation oncology to, to get this done. Um, you know, of course, uh, Dr. Misios has been on our on our uh, podcast before, and he's uh, one of the main drivers for stereotactic radio surgery in the tumor world. Uh, and, and you know, certainly, you've, this is a very, very effective uh, treatment, and we're we're very excited about it. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. I think that really sums everything up as as much as we can. Uh, Super. Yeah. Th thank you, Jason, and thank you guys for watching. Um, please don't forget to like and subscribe our, to uh, our channel, like our videos, and subscribe to our channel. And uh, we'll catch you again in another episode. Thank, Thank you. you.